So for this um, research seminar, we've got Jake Hollibon, Hollibon here, who is Principal Research Engineer at Audio Scenic. So Audio Scenic, we know quite well because Audio Scenic sprang out of a research project between the universities of Surrey, Southampton and Salford and the BBC some, how many years ago? I think it finished. Seven years? Four years ago, five years ago. Five years ago? Yeah, been been quite, quite some time ago. And uh, Audio Scenic, their technology kind of sprang out of that research project and it, the, the first commercial pro product using it has, has now been launched, which you will see here. So uh, the people who are here in person will actually get to get a chance to, to hear this uh, a little bit later. We're going to leave a bit of space at, at the end so there's time to go around uh, only one person at a time. So we'll have to shuffle you through, form an orderly queue when we get to the end of the uh, presentation. And we'll make sure that uh, as many as possible as possible of you get to hear it. Um, so without further ado, I shall hand over to Jake and uh, I shall log on to Teams here in case there are any questions that pop up. Great. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, you've already stolen my first slide. <laughs> That's okay. So today I'm going to be talking on demystifying cross-door cancellation. So this is the core tech behind what we do at Audio Scenic. Um, it's founded in a lot of wonderful mass sound field reproduction beamforming theory, but you'll be glad to know I'm going to avoid all of that today. And I'm going to try and present this in a bit more of an intuitive graphical way to get the idea behind why do you need cross-door cancellation? What are some of the pros and cons of using it? Um, how can you do it with just two speakers? We're going to spend a lot of time just focusing on a two-channel classic stereo pair, which is a very traditional way of doing cross-talk cancellation. And then we're going to move on to our flavour of cross-talk cancellation at Audio Scenic and why we use a loudspeaker array like you can see over there, and also why we use listener tracking. The clicker has stopped working. There you go. So as I said, Ben saw my first slide. Out. Very quick introduction to who we are at Audio Scenic. We are a tech startup that came out of the University of Southampton, out of some research at the ISVR with uh, Philippe Fatsi and Marcus Simon, uh, focusing during this SVA project, which was with um, Salford, Surrey and BBC, looking at what is the future of spatial audio in the home living room environment. And from this, this research into using soundbars to create personalised user focused 3D audio experiences was really the main flavour of research at ISBR. Um, and Filippo and Marcus said, we've got to make this into a product. And so Audio Scenic was born. So we're talking about spatial audio reproduction, and hopefully some of you are fairly familiar now with spatial immersive 3D audio, whichever catchphrase you want to use to describe it. And we can broadly break down spatial audio reproduction. We're not so focused on the capture here, but purely on how we reproduce a spatial audio experience into loudspeaker and headphone based techniques. The issue with the loudspeaker based techniques is they often require a huge array of loudspeakers and generally to create a, a fully 3D experience, so be able to reproduce a sound field across three dimensions, you generally need speakers arranged in 3D space. So you need a big sphere of speakers. And unfortunately, not many people can fit those in their living room. So it's not the most practical approach. But from that, we have lots of work in lots of great techniques that some of you might be familiar with, things like ambisonics, I think you've got a wave field synthesis set up here at Salford, uh, panning approaches, classic surround sound as well. The other option is we do headphone based reproduction, and this is really popular at the moment. If anyone has, say, Apple AirPods, you will know that they do spatial audio and they have head tracking, and that is through what we call binaural audio, which we can synthesize by using a head related trance function, or we can record using a real dummy head. So let's go and dig into what binaural is very briefly. So let's imagine we've got a little dummy head here. So here's our little head. This could be a real person or it could be a microphone. And we put some microphones in their ears. And then we've got a sound source over on the right here. And if we look at the signals recorded by those two microphones, we're going to have a number of what we call localization cues encoded in that binaural audio stream. So for example, the source is on the right. So you'd expect there to be some interaural cues, that's differences in the left and the right ear signal, such as a level difference. The right ear should be louder than the left ear at high frequencies for that source on the right. There'll be a time difference. The source is on the right, so it'll hit the right ear first. And it's information like this, which is encoded in binaural audio, which lets us localize and spatialize sound in 3D. This is how we can use just two channels to reproduce a full 3D 
spatial audio experience. But the issue is, this is as if we've recorded microphones right in your ears, OK? So how do we reproduce those signals? Well, traditionally, we put a pair of headphones on someone and we pipe that very specific left ear signal to your left ear and the right ear binaural signal to your right ear. So what happens if we want to use speakers to reproduce binaural audio? And that is exactly what we do here at Audio Scenic. We say, OK, binaural audio is great, it's immersive, but we don't always want to wear headphones. Um, there's lots of times I'm listening to music, I don't want to wear headphones, or I've got multiple people in the room, I don't want to be separated from them in this immersive experience. So how can we listen to binaural audio over speakers? So let's try it. So here we've got our dummy head, and again, we've got that source over there. We're recording this specific binaural audio. We've got our left and right ear signals. And let's imagine we just have a classic stereo pair of speakers. So we've got a left speaker, a right speaker, and a listener sat directly in the center of them. And let's say we do something very basic, but a good first try. And let's just pipe the left binaural audio to the left speaker and the right binaural audio to the right speaker. What's going to happen? Well, sure enough, this right ear is going to hear the right binaural signal that gets emitted from the right speaker. But we're also going to have this issue of crosstalk because this left speaker is emitting the left binaural signal. That's going to be heard by both ears. And we're no longer going to preserve these localization cues that are encoded in the binaural audio because we're mixing the two channels. The spatial illusion is going to collapse. So this is the fundamental issue of crosstalk, which gives rise to what we call crosstalk cancellation, where we're trying to remove these crosstalk paths and just reproduce at the ears these given left and right binaural signals. I'm going to use this way of describing a bit of what we do quite a lot during the presentation. So let's just take a moment to familiarize ourselves. What we've got here is some time series, and we're going to look at some target signals we're trying to reproduce. So that's at the top here. So I'm going to imagine we want to reproduce this uh, test signal, which is going to be an uh, impulse in the left ear. So an instantaneous click in the left ear and silence in the right ear at all times. So ideally, we'd have a magnitude response of just zero dB in the left ear and nothing in the right ear. And then at the bottom, we're going to plot what the loudspeakers might play as a time series to reproduce this given target signal. And then what we pick up at the microphones at the ears of the listener. So based on that previous slide, let's say we reproduce this target binaural signal by just piping it into the left and the right speaker. So the left speaker will get an impulse, the right speaker plays nothing. And sure enough, the left ear is our impulse like we desire. But we have this crosstalk term, this leakage term, which gets heard by the right ear. Um, and actually, that's very well defined. We know exactly when that leakage crosstalk term arrives. It arrives by some time, some ITD time relevant to that speaker later. And it arrives with an attenuation due to the ILD, the scattering, the absorption of the head due to that left speaker. So this is the issue. This is what we don't like and we want to get rid of. Well, that's okay. We're clever signal processing DSP engineers. I'm sure we can find a solution. So why don't we try and play a signal in the right speaker in antiphase, bearing in mind we know exactly when that crosstalk term arrives and what amplitude it arrives, and see what happens. Okay, here's our cancellation signal going to our right loudspeaker. And sure enough, the right ear is hopefully going to, those two peaks are going to arrive and they're going to sum to zero. We're going to remove our cancellation, our crosstalk term. What does that look like as a very simple DSP diagram? Well, this is what we had before. We were piping the binaural audio directly into the left and the right speaker. Now to perform this cancellation step, we just have another path. We delay it by that ITD amount of time. We flip the polarity. So it's going to arrive in anti-phase when it arrives at the other ear. And then we pipe that into the other speaker. We repeat that for both channels as well. And this is a very early and classic form of doing crosstalk cancellation. There's some work by Schroeder, who you might know from room acoustics, um, that actually did this back in, I think, the 60s it was. OK, let's recap. So we play our left impulse in our left speaker. We're trying to reproduce this left impulse with nothing in the right ear. Our left ear, here's the impulse, we get our, our crosstalk term. We play our cancellation from our right speaker. That arrives, we cancel, but of course we cause another problem. Now our left ear also hears this flipped polarity cancellation term. 
So we have achieved our goal. We've achieved audio in the left ear only and cancellation zero silence in the right ear. But we've done so at the cost of introducing a big issue in the coloration of the left ear. What does that look like? Well, it's a pulse followed by a single echo. What does that cause? Cone filter. A very well defined cone filter because we know exactly how long after the initial pulse that echo, if you like, we like to think of that in terms of room acoustics arrives. Well, that's still OK, always not lost. As I said, we're very clever DSP engineers. I'm sure we can find a way around this. So this is our response for our cone filter. It's a classical bit of acoustics. Um, it's got a nice analytical equation. The time dictates which frequencies you have this cone cancellation at. It's an FIR filter because it's just an initial pulse and then a delayed echo arriving at some point later. Why don't we just invert it? Let's create a filter which equalizes this response because ideally we don't want a cone filter response to that left ear. We want a perfectly flat response because otherwise the signal is going to sound really colored. We can invert it. We've got the equations there. I won't bore you too much the details of them. But that equalization filter, first of all, looks very nasty. You know, we're having to flip this magnitude response to perform that equalization. So we're putting huge amounts of energy into very narrow frequencies. And the big issue. This goes from an FIR problem to an IAR equalization. So that means that just to reproduce this single pulse, we're going to have to have an IIR implementation. It means it's going to go on forever. Um, and we're going to see that on the next slide. OK, let's recap once again. We want to reproduce this left pulse. We play the left pulse. It gets heard by the left ear. We play our cancellation. We cancel the right ear. We have our cone filter due to this issue at the left ear, what happens if we now apply our IIR equalization? Well, for every equalization we play in the left, we have to apply some more cancellation in the right. And then, so on, we end up with our IR equalization filter on the left speaker and a huge amount of corresponding cancellation points on the right. Bear in mind, all we wanted to do with these two speakers was make this pulse in the left ear, but we've had to go through all of this effort and all of this energy, which purely goes into cancellation, goes into making silence just to reproduce that pulse. That is crosstalk cancellation in the classic two channel case. And this is assuming that everything aligns perfectly. If one of those peaks doesn't align with the cancellation peak, then you're making even more problems for yourself because suddenly you're going to hear the sound twice. So it'll be even more colored. So I would say this system is not very robust and we'll get back to that later on in the slides. And what does the filters look like when we actually implement this in practice? Well, it looked like as on the previous slide, it's a very nasty filter with massive boosts at certain frequencies. I'm going to refer to these as problem frequencies. We'll come back to them in a minute. Um, it's a very nasty system to actually implement. So what I'm going to do now is show you, um, I'm going to have a couple of animations like this, some sound field animations. So here you're going to see we've got a pair of speakers. Here's our stereo pair. Here's our listener with their left and their right ear. And we're going to show the sound field due to these given speaker signals and how all the waves from those speakers interact and combine to do what we so determine, which is create this pulse. In this case, it's going to be a pulse in the right ear. So it's going to be a one here and then silence over here. So let's play the animation. So I'll pause there straight away. This is the desired signal. This is the pulse we're trying to reproduce. That's our target signal. All of the uh, waves that the speakers emit after this are purely energy going into the cancellation. Oh, sorry, we'll pause it. Just. There, so at this point we can see coming in here, that's our design signal about to hit the right ear. That's our one. And then we can see the combination of all these waves are creating nulls that are going to pass through the left ear and then also through the right ear. Because all this extra energy which is going into cancellation has to ensure there's no extra information reproduced at the listener's ears after this initial pulse. And this is going to ring out for a very long time. Remember, technically it's an IAR. 
it will eventually fade out to, to nothing. You can approximate this in practice as an FIR. But this is a huge amount of energy going into cancellation just to reproduce that given pulse. And it wouldn't have taken much for that listener to be moved slightly off centre. And then their ears would no longer be in that exact bright and cancellation points anymore. OK, we've got a, a rough idea of what cross cancellation is and why we might need it, how it looks with a two channel case. We're now going to do something slightly different and we're going to look at binaural signals through a modal decomposition. So what do I mean by that? If you've heard of mid side stereo, it's something very, very similar. In mid side stereo, you can take two speaker signals for a stereo speaker pair and you look at the common elements. You look at the sum of those two signals, which gives you this mid common channel. And then you look at the difference in the speaker signals and that gives you this side channel. It's like the information which is in one channel, but not in the other. We can do something very similar with binaural signals by looking at in phase and out of phase modes. So by an in phase mode, I mean we look at the sum of the two signals, the content which is shared by both channels. So it's as if both ears were working in phase and out of phase would be flashing one and minus one at any given point. For this setup, again, two speakers, a listener perfectly in the centre, it's symmetric. We know that if these speakers play a sound in phase, OK, then that will lead to an in phase signal recorded at the microphones, at the listener's ears. So in phase speaker signals generate in phase signals at the listener's ears. And the same is true for out of phase. If we play these speakers out of phase for this symmetric setup, there's a helpful scenario to understand it. This is going to lead to out of phase signals at the listener's ears as well. Let's have a look at an animation of that working. So now we've got our speakers situated on the left here. We've got our listeners' ears or microphones that are here. And we're going to plot the sound field as it propagates and these speakers radiate in phase. We'll have the speaker signals up here and the microphone signals down here. And sure enough, you can see the speaker signals are in phase because they're mapped over each other. And you can see the microphone signals are also in phase because they're mapped over each other as well. So there's an issue that occurs when we use this viewpoint to look at cross talk cancellation, and that's what we call the heart wavelength problem. So there will be certain frequencies where you cannot reproduce this in phase mode very efficiently. When does that occur? Well, if we have the path length frequencies from, let's just consider the right ear for the moment, and we say R1 is this distance from the right speaker to the right ear, R2 is the distance from the left speaker to the right ear, and it's slightly bigger than R1, so it could be written as R1 plus a little extra amount of radial distance. When that extra path length difference corresponds to half a wavelength, the signals from those two speakers, which are being driven in phase at the source, but will arrive out of phase by 180 degree phase shift at that given ear. So what happens? Signal sum to zero. So there are certain frequencies at this half wavelength issue point when you cannot reproduce an in phase signal at the listener's ears or rather you can but the efficiency what we call the transfer of energy from this speaker mode to the ear modes is very poor and if any of you have ever done any singular value decomposition which some of you might have some of you might have not this is actually all from an svd analysis you have some speaker modes that's one basis you have some ear modes that's another basis and then the transfer of the efficiency of the energy is given by the singular values but i promise not too much maths so we will leave that there Interesting aside, this is why when you do classic stereo amplitude panning, because bear in mind, we're actually not talking about cross talk cancellation at all at the moment. We're just talking about driving two speakers in phase. That's what stereo does, right? To make a phantom center image, apply the same signal to both speakers with equal amplitude. That is why the phantom center source for a stereo panning system sounds colored, because there are certain, there are certain frequencies you cannot reproduce that phantom center because of the lack of efficiency of the transfer of the modal energy. It's a bit of a mouthful. The same thing happens as well for the out of phase mode, uh, just it happens at a wavelength path difference as opposed to wavelength over two, because there's already a 180 phase shift between the signals of the speakers when you initiate them. Okay, same animation again, but now I'm plotting this at a frequency where we have this half wavelength issue. So again, this is very much physical, very much on the physics and the acoustics. Um, you can't get around the physics. 
as much as we can be clever with DSP, you can never beat the physics and the acoustics. Um, and it is completely dependent on the path length differences from these speakers to these microphones. So we can see we're driving the speakers nice and loud, both in phase, but the microphone signals we then pick up are tiny because the energy transfer is very poor at this given frequency. What I've plotted here is um, an initiative idea of when you have this problem frequencies um, and how they relate between the in phase and the outer phase mode. So the mode efficiency, that's like how efficient is that energy transfer? So a big number means it's very efficient. It's very easy for the speakers to reproduce that same mode that the listeners is. And the low number means it's very hard to. So sure enough, in red, we see the outer phase modes. And when the, uh, the ratio of the wavelength to the path difference is a half, that is when we have our issue frequency. And then for the outer phase mode, we see that at a wavelength. Again, we're not actually talking about cross talk cancellation here, but now this is where we bring it back to cross talk cancellation. This is very much the physics and the acoustics of what happens with a pair of speakers to a pair of microphones. But in cross talk cancellation, we've already talked a little bit about inverting a problem. We inverted that equalized response. Well, when we set up our cross talk cancellation filters, we invert a representation of the physics of what's happening with our speakers and our ears. So what we end up doing is inverting this. And this is what dictates how the CTC filters and how the magnitude of those filters looks. Remember a minute ago, I showed you that IAR with that horrible peaks when we inverted it. Well, this is the cause of those peaks. There are certain frequencies where that system cannot reproduce an in phase or an out of phase mode. And in practice, this means that our crosstalk cancellation filters have these horrible exploding peaks in the magnitudes response. Okay, that's a lot on two channel crosstalk cancellation, but you'll notice that I've got a soundbar over there and that's got five channels in it. That's a loudspeaker array. Um, so let's now link into what we do at Audio Scenic and why we think arrays are the way forward for crosstalk cancellation. Here's our two channel system. And sure enough, as we've just been talking about, we've got these horrible peaks in the filters to reproduce this one zero target signal. So a flat zero dB with all the equalization and no leakage at the other ear. Let's add another speaker. So a very simple thing we'll do is add one more speaker. We've got a left right pair, so let's add a center speaker because that's a very common speaker arrangement. That's uh, what most people have if you have a surround sound system. What happens when we add the center speaker? Well, this is a very special case, actually. Remember, we we're talking about in phase and out of phase modes. Well, what signal can a perfectly centered speaker reproduce at both ears? It can only reproduce an in phase signal because whatever that speaker plays, both ears, if everything's symmetric, are going to hear that identically. OK, so the center speaker gives us the ultimate increase in efficiency when it comes to reproducing that in phase mode. And that means all the peaks, the problem frequencies we had originally of the two channel system that corresponded to not being able to reproduce the in phase mode, that half wavelength points disappear. They're no longer an issue for the system because we have this extra speaker. It gives the system another degree of freedom that can very efficiently reproduce the in phase mode. Remember, this is all physics, OK? It's all the physics of the transmission of energy from where these speakers are placed to where these microphones are placed. There's an interest in the side here as well, actually. If you are ever familiar with any of the mathematics, when we do the inversion, we use what's called a minimum norm or minimum energy solution. So you might think that if we wanted to create a virtual sound source at the center speaker, a sensible thing would just be to activate that speaker. So give it a gain of one and give the left and the right speakers a gain of zero. That would be a very sensible thing to do. But when we actually do this in crosstalk cancellation, the minimum energy way of reproducing this is if you apply all three speakers with a gain of one third. Because one third squared plus one third squared plus one third squared is smaller than one. So it's a lower energy solution. And that corresponds to the array mode of now, as opposed to having just one speaker active and zero here, all three of the speakers working in phase. So there's this really nice mapping between these array modes and the listener ear modes, even as we go to multi channel systems. Cool, three channels, that's fine. Let's go to five channels. And sure enough, so we've added another pair of speakers. 
in the centre now. Sure enough, we're going to remove more of those problem frequencies because these frequencies were due to uh, out of phase modes given by the specific arrangement of that stereo pair, the outer stereo pair. But now we've added another pair of speakers. We've broken the physics up. We've given the system some more degrees of freedom at those problem frequencies. So once again, we remove the peaks in the filter magnitudes, and suddenly these filters are a lot nicer to implement in practice. So this is one way of looking at the benefits of arrays, just in terms of the magnitude response of the filters, but also anything that happens in the frequency domain, there's also an effect in the time domain, right? So let's have a look at another animation. Here we've got a nice big speaker array, and once again, we're going to be beaming the sound just to one ear and having cancellation at the other ear. Recall back to the animation with the two channel system, how much energy had to go into cancellation, how long that pair of speakers rang out for just to perform this very target, this very simple target signal. Now let's have a look what happens when we use a speaker array. So the time domain response of the speaker signals is so much more compact. Play that one once again. We can see all the speaker signals playing and combining to make this nice coherent waveform focus at the left ear, and then we have no audio leakage to the right ear. So it makes the crossover cancellation problem so much easier to implement, so much more robust as well. And let's get on, on to robustness. You can definitely achieve crossover cancellation with two speakers, but I spoke about that being a very unrobust solution. And by robustness, we generally talk about the energy that gets radiated into the room. So, so far, we've been assuming a nice anechoic chamber, right? But in practice, you put this system in a room, any energy that those speakers emit, it's going to go out into the room. It's going to come back to your listeners ears at some point later as reverberation. You can sort of think of reverberation as more profitable, right? More echoes, more copies of the binaural signals, which are going to arrive later, and they're only going to cause us issues later down the line because they're going to be extra cross talk terms. So I've plotted here some directivity patterns of a nice big 28 loudspeaker array in red and the two channel loudspeaker array in blue. And this is uh, again trying to do a one zero. So you can see both systems achieve that. They both have this nice one aimed at the left ear and the null aimed at the right ear. So actually both technically have been asked have achieved what we've asked them to do. But the energy that gets radiated into all the other directions is greatly minimized by the array because we have the array, we have these extra degrees of freedom, and we have this enhanced directivity. So we send considerably less energy out into the room. And then that corresponds to a better direct to reverberant ratio. That leads to better CTC performance, more robust CTC performance as well. So why use a loudspeaker array? Why uh, spend all that extra money, get lots more speakers, lots more amplifier channels? lots more signal processing. Well, we like to think there's lots of benefits to it. First of all, we get this better natural CTC. So that is the array itself has directivity, as we saw in the last plot. And you can see here on this sound field plot, the array can create an excellent beam of this frequency to the left ear. And it doesn't have to put nearly any energy into the cancellation because it's already achieved that directivity. It's already achieved a tight beam of audio exactly where we want it. It doesn't have to cancel any leakage term because there isn't any leakage term to begin with. So that's what we refer to as natural crustal cancellation with the array. We've already seen as well that they're much nicer filters to implement. Frequency responses don't have any of those nasty ringing issue frequencies. Uh, we get more system robustness and we get better direct to reverberant ratio. But what happens if the listener moves? So far, we've assumed everything is perfectly symmetric, that the listener is perfectly in the center of your loudspeaker array. And anyone that has a, a, maybe even a surround system at home will know that it's very hard to get the speakers in the right position in a real room. Slightly easier when you've got a soundbar. Um, but we're assuming that the listener has been perfectly in the center of that soundbar. What I've got an animation here of is a listener moving a soundbar about that size, five channels, so very similar to the one we're going to demo later. And they're just moving gently left to right. They're moving actually a very small amount, about eight centimeters to the left and then eight centimeters to the right. So that's like the equivalent of you maybe shifting in your chair to sit slightly differently. And what we've done here is we're trying to reproduce 
the illusion of two virtual sources in green, one on the left and one on the right. And the CTC system thinks the listener is always here, smack bang in the middle on the red dotted line. We've then simulated this problem, simulated the effects of the speakers, simulated what the actual signals that the listener was here. And we then used the mapping from those binaural signals to give us an estimated source position that the listener would perceive these sources at. And that's what we're showing in red. So you can see as the listener moves, as they're on the center axis, the red and the green dots align. So the CTC system and the listener are in the right positions. So we get the correct perceived source positions. But as they move left and right, these red perceived positions are flying around. We get a loss in the desired imaging of the system. And this is where I think the real another thing that we do at Audio Cinet comes into play. And this is using listener head tracking. So we have a camera, an infrared sensor, any form of listener tracking in one of the soundbars. We know where the listener is at any one given moment. And for every signal processing block, we update the filters to account for that new listener position. So no matter where the listener moves over the scene, we're always effectively steering those beams and directing those beams to that new listener location. So the listener is always in the sweet spot. The sweet spot has been a classic issue in spatial audio over speakers for years, ever since stereo was invented. And if you ever actually listen to a really well set up stereo system, you'll know it can be fantastic. But we so often are never in the correct sweet spot, in the correct sweet spot. So often some delay, some difference in the speaker signals that you receive at the microphone's ears because of not being in the sweet spot. And using this tech, we can ensure that you are always in the sweet spot of that given system. So here's a little more of a marketing promo, I'd say. Amazing that this guy can move left and right without actually moving <laughs> any limbs. Um, but just to illustrate the idea, we're creating these beams through your ears, and then no matter where you are, we can adapt to that new listener position. Here's a slightly more scientific animation showing that. So here we've got the full problem. So we're not just doing one zero, we're doing one zero zero one. So that is the full reproduction problem to reproduce the left and the right ear binaural signal. OK, and that's showing these left and right ear beams in blue and in red. So we can see, for example, in red, we've got our beam steered to the right ear and then our null of where the left ear is. And as the listener moves, represented by these red stars, we can see that we're going to recompute the effects of the directivity patterns. We're going to update our filters to wherever the listener is positioned, and we're going to achieve that control, that one zero control, no matter where the listener is around the array. OK, now let's add on to that graphic we had earlier. What happens when you use this listener tracking, which is now in blue, we call the audio scenic um, statement. What happens to these perceived virtual source positions? Well, sure enough, they're not perfect. And it's fair to say that the center of the soundbar is always going to be the optimal position. You know, if a small soundbar this big, if you walk all the way over here, it is going to start to struggle. Um, again, that's just the physics and the, uh, the acoustics behind it. But by and large, now as the listener moves left and right, the blue perceived source positions, when you're using that listener tracking, stays in the right place, matches the green dots as we so desire. OK, so that's me coming to the end of the presentation. I've tried to keep it a bit more compact because, as you can see, we've got I don't know how compact I was, actually, but we've got a soundbar over there um, and I'd be very happy to give some of you guys a demo. You can all actually try this out and practice. It's one thing talking about it. It's another thing hearing it. This is our first product. We released this earlier in January. Uh, it was released with Razer, who, if you know a bit about computer gaming, they're a computer gaming accessory manufacturer. And this is designed, as I said, for computer gaming. So the idea is you put the soundbar underneath your computer monitor. Uh, 3D spatial binaural audio is really key in gaming these days. It really gives you a competitive edge because, you know, you can hear someone coming around from behind you before you have any other visual cue of it. Um, but you are often stuck with using headphones. This lets you have that full spatial audio experience without the need for the gamer to wear headphones. You can tell it's a gaming product. It's got lots of LEDs on it. Um, and it won a lot of awards at CES, which we're also really proud of. So um, we've got one over there. Uh, it's a single listener soundbar, so you can each have a little quick listen of a given clip. Um, hopefully early next year, we're going to have a few more products out. We're sort of throwing this technology and seeing wherever it sticks. Um, so 
obviously the home living room is a big environment for us. We're also looking at automotive, so having different sound zones for the driver and the passenger. So, you know, the driver can hear the sat nav and the passenger can listen to their music. Or um, also more portable devices like laptops or teleconferencing on computer monitors. So watch this space. Hopefully we'll have a few more things, maybe a product you might want to buy in a few uh, months or years time. Uh, but for that, thank you very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed that and I'd love to give you some demos.